Hola, bienvenidos una vez más a 2084. Este es el episodio 15 con el doctor John Grzynski, que nos va a platicar un poco de la secuenciación del genoma humano y también vamos a hacerlo de manera en inglés, más que nada. Así que, hello, Dr. Grzynski, welcome to 2084. I was just telling the audience that we'll proceed in English as we have done for some of the past episodes. And I just wanted to give them a little bit of introduction about yourself, which right now you will, of course, compliment me and take over. But you're a doctor of philosophy at Stanford. And you also have a PhD in genetics from also Stanford University and a veterinarian degree from the University of London. So if you could just tell us about how is it that you have arrived to your area of study and what interests you the most. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. So uh, I I studied uh, as as an undergraduate in in New York, and I studied biology with a minor in chemistry. And at the time, I thought that uh, I'd, I'd go into human medicine, uh, but but things changed throughout life, and I decided that that wasn't the the right career path for me. So uh, I I continued to look for ways that I could still practice uh, medicine uh, without the the human aspect to it. So so I, I came to veterinary medicine, uh, and and with that I studied at the the University of London, uh, where where I got all of my clinical training. Uh, while I was at the University of London, though, I started on a uh, a research project where I was looking at genetic determinants of cardiovascular disease in a family of great apes uh, that uh, th there were a few individuals who died uh, of a sudden cardiac death. And uh, because they were related, we suspected that there was some sort of genetic etiology to their disease. With that said, at the time, uh, Uh, whole genome sequencing was far too expensive to, to ever consider uh, in human or animal medicine. So, so we were sequencing very small portions of the genome looking for uh, different variants that may be associated with, with this disease in, in this family of chimpanzees. Unfortunately, we never really came uh, to any real conclusions with that. But as I continued on my path as, as a, a veterinarian, Uh, I, I was always thinking about ways that we could use sequencing technologies to, to better answer this question. Uh, so over time, uh, uh, sequencing technologies became uh, a more robust and equally cheaper. And, and with that, uh, the integration into human and animal medicine became a, a thing of reality. So with that, I decided to uh, take a step back from my clinical practice as a veterinarian and, and apply for my PhD. Uh, and, and I ended up taking an offer at, at Stanford University, uh, where, where my aim of the PhD was to use new genome sequencing technologies to, to really better the health of, of our animal populations with, with this specific interest uh, continuing in, in heart disease in, in grade eight species. Uh, and, and during my time as a PhD student, I, I spent a lot of time doing that and, and also traveling uh, to see different, different uh, troops of gorillas or uh, chimpanzees um, and, and sequencing their genomes. But unfortunately, when, when COVID hit, uh, I, I wasn't able to travel so much anymore. So, so I started to think about ways that I could use genome sequencing technologies uh, here, here at home in California. And uh, my uh, uh, PI and, and I decided that, that we'd try and use the genome sequencing technologies that we had within our lab to uh, uh, create a really fast uh, genetic diagnosis, uh, diagnostic test. Um, and, and really that's where the, the, this story was born. How we started it in, in June of 2020 and uh, And here we are in 2022 with a, with a complete project that, that I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. With, without a doubt, just to give a little bit of introduction to, to yourself, you even broke the world record. <laughs> here, Dr. Gorsinski has the Guinness World Record for fastest genetic sequencing, which we'll talk a little bit more. But before we get there, could you give a quick overview of what is, a genetic, what is genetic sequencing? Yeah, absolutely. So 
when we think about uh, genetics and genes, really um, what, what we're focused on is, is DNA, right? And, and DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is, is essentially uh, our blueprint, it's it's any living being's blueprint, uh, and, and it can be extremely long. And uh, we, we call the, the entire blueprint, which is made up of DNA, um, uh, our genome. Now, genomes are, are broken into uh, uh, smaller bits, so we can get down um, to, to genes, which have uh, very specific responsibilities in the body. And each one of those genes can be further divided into exons, and those exons are made up of strands, linear strands of DNA. And each, uh, each one of those strands of DNA, uh, it, its most basic unit is going to be uh, a base a base pair, so an A, T, C, or G. And when we think about uh, genome sequencing, specifically what we're doing is we're reading the, uh, the sequence of those A, T, Cs, and Gs uh, um, because each, each individual may have uh, a unique sequence uh, that, that makes a, a species a species or, or an individual an individual. So, so we look at uh, the, the uh, uh, sequence of ATCs and Gs and, and assemble it into an entire genome. Uh, and, and that's what we call genome sequencing. Great. Very interesting. I gotta say, it's amazing how much we're learning about the, the human body. And especially right now, you mentioned exons, but what do we know about these particular sets that are called entrions, which people believe for them to be just trash? Do, do we still not know if they serve us for as any information or sure absolutely so so intronic regions of a gene are the genes uh or are, are the part of the genes that don't code for some sort of amino acid right um so so when i was talking about atcs and g's when we put them in in different combinations uh in, in three base pair units those can create amino acids and when those amino acids are compiled uh, they, they can create proteins that have very specific function now when we think about uh, uh, not the coding parts of the region, uh, not the coding part of, of the gene, and we think about the intronic regions, uh, yeah, a lot of people think that it's just a bunch of trash DNA. We know that there are, uh, you know, parts within the intronic regions that uh, do have uh, uh, a function. So we know that there are uh, sites that that define splicing, and this is getting pretty pretty deep into the weeds in in genetics. But uh, uh, some genes have multiple exons, and some of those exons are included in in some genes, and and sometimes they're not. Uh, and and it's really dependent on on what that gene's function is in that part particular cell. Um, so we know that there are splicing sites or uh, um, instructions in terms of how to splice uh, a gene within this intronic region. And there may be other regulatory elements in, in uh, these intronic regions as well. Um, although we, we think of uh, the intergenic regions to be more associated with uh, our regulatory factors in terms of how much a gene should be expressed or, or not within, within a certain cell type. Dr. Grusinski, uh getting a little bit away from this technical aspects, which honestly, uh, other, it's very interesting, but for example, for myself that I, I don't know that much about all the, these technical parts of genetics and, and biology, it's kind of confusing. So I want our audience to kind of be able to grasp uh, what are the real life results that, that this technology can, can give us. Because for example, people like me that we see, I don't know, YouTube videos, for example, I've even seen some guys that that I don't know, they put jellyfish uh, DNA into dogs to make them glow in the darks or some sure. crazy stuff. So, yeah, what what is it in the reality of this technology? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's that's great. Why don't we take a step back and and uh, talk about the implications of of genome sequencing? So, uh, like I said, genome sequencing. We're looking at the the sequence of A, T, Cs, and Gs within within the uh, genome, and and we can do that specifically to look at uh, parts of the genome that may be responsible for a certain trait whether it's your, your hair color or your eye color or how tall you are or, or you know, whatever makes you you. 
um, you know, we, we can start to interrogate the entire genome to, to look for uh, genes that are responsible for that. Now, that's, that's quite simple. But uh, we, we can sort of translate that into medicine and rather than look for traits such as, you know, physical observable traits, we, we can think about uh, how, how genes may affect one's uh, uh, risk to uh, get a certain disease, or we can look at someone with a certain disease and then backtrack and see if, if there's some sort of genetic cause uh, as a result of that disease. And by sequencing the genome, uh, we, we can get a pretty clear picture as to uh, uh, whether an individual with the disease, if those clinical signs that they're presenting with are a result of uh, some sort of change within the genome. Uh, and, and the only way that we can see these changes in the genome is to actually sequence it. And in fact, I, I would say this is a good point. I already heard the story from Dr. Gorczynski, but this is a pretty good intro to how is it that you broke the Guinness World Record and what were you looking for? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, like like I mentioned earlier, my boss and I decided that we we were going to to use the sequencing technology that we had in our lab and and see if we could make really fast genetic tests. And the reason we wanted to do it really fast was because there are patients that are critically ill. They come into the hospital. They're you know uh, at at uh, a crossroads where either a, a diagnosis is going to help them and we'll be able to provide them with effective treatment and, and get them better, um, or or maybe or maybe not, unfortunately. But with that said, we we need to get a, a really fast diagnosis for these patients, whether they're in uh, cardiac failure or, or uh, having seizures that can't be controlled with medicine. We need to find the exact cause of that, and and we need to find it quickly in order to provide them the care that they need in order to get them to recover. So this was the whole idea, and what we decided to do, uh, we. All of the previous uh, genome sequencing technologies or fast and, and rapid uh, genome sequencing tests uh, used a technology that's called sequencing by synthesis, uh, which essentially takes the strands of DNA and it needs to amplify them. Uh, and, and as it amplifies them and, and uh, creates multiple copies of these strands of DNA, then it can uh, incorporate uh, colors into each one of these base pairs, essentially, and, and it can take a photo. And from there, you can uh, then identify the, the sequence of bases within this, this part of the genome. With that said, whenever we amplify DNA, it takes a lot of time, right? We're, we're talking hours, if not days, in order to, to amplify the DNA to the point that, that we need in order to get the appropriate sequencing. So we switched this type of technology uh, and, and we started using uh, a technology that was developed by Oxford Nanopore, where rather than amplifying the DNA and essentially taking pictures uh, to, to identify colors that are associated with the a, T, C's, and G's, we take a strand of DNA uh, um, and we pull it through a nanopore. Now, a nanopore is, is super, super tiny, um, and, and uh, there, there's a hole in it, as, as uh, it says in the name. And, and by attaching a motor protein to the DNA, we can have that strand of DNA pulled through this nanopore. And at the bottom of the nanopore, there's an electrical current. And as the strand of DNA is pulled through that electrical current, uh, we can measure the, the changes um, in, in that current, uh, which can then be translated into the genetic sequence. So as an A passes, we may get some signal uh, in terms of change of the, the electrical current, or a T or a C or a G passes through, we'll get a different signal. And, and with that, we can then get our, our genetic sequence. Now, the benefit of this sequencing technology is there's no need for any sort of amplification. So we can take the DNA that we extract from a, a biological sample, um, we can prepare it uh, by, by adapting those, those proteins, uh, and then we can put it on our sequencer, and in real time, we can get uh, uh, genome sequencing data uh, without the need for, for amplification and, and the time associated with that amplification. Oh, very interesting. Um, so is this similar in, in some sort of some popular um, 
I don't know if it's sequencing, but it's DNA technologies are, that are very popular. For example, 23andMe, I know, well, for example, me and a lot of friends, we, we have this this uh, technology that we bought and it, it's very neat because it's it kind of helps you interpret uh, the, 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 your data a little bit. How, how similar are these things? And uh, for example, one thing I know about the 23andMe is that it is, it's there's a big like surveillance problem and, and people are worried about that part that people know too much of your data. So how similar are these things? And, and I, I would also like to, to know what you think about that part of privacy. Yeah, absolutely. So 23andMe and other types of uh, 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 ancestry types of companies. So uh, there, there's another one that is called Ancestry, but there's all of these direct to consumer um, genome sequencing types of companies that that can uh, predict your your ancestry or or uh, the likelihood that you'll develop a, a certain type of disease. The technology that they use is is not quite uh, genome sequencing, though. They use what's called uh, a microarray. Um, where they look at uh, uh, very specific parts of, of your genome uh, and, and get the genetic sequence in, in just a tiny part of it. Um, and by surveying the entire genome uh, at, at different uh, points, they can predict uh, what the rest of your genome uh, would be. Uh, so, so it's not necessarily genome sequencing, but it is definitely uh, you know, taking a look at, at a wide part of, of one's genome. Um, but it's not sequencing every single base pair within the genome. Hence, it's not called genome sequencing. It's it's going to be a, a microarray. With how that said, how is it, said, oh, sorry, is it they, they predict what the rest of the genome will be? Yeah, it so it, it's called, uh, they, they use programs that impute data. So essentially, it's, it's uh, using statistics to predict what the, the rest of the, the uh, DNA sequence would be. Um, and, and again, how that prediction is made, it would be getting really, really deep into uh, genetics, which, which I don't think we have time to explain. But imputation is, is what it's called, and, and it's a statistical modeling that uh, allows for, for that prediction. Uh, Great. We'll, we'll leave it at stats then. <laughs> yes, yes, stats yeah. explains it all. Uh, with that said, in, in terms of privacy, when, when it comes to uh, companies like 23andMe, um, it, it's, it's a difficult topic to, to discuss, I think. There, there are a lot of uh, different ethical um, uh, problems that, that need to be addressed, and maybe I shouldn't call them problems, but uh, there, there are different ethical considerations that need to be made. Our genome is what makes us unique individuals, right? And there are lots of things that, that can be predicted from our genome uh, that aren't things like uh, a predilection to disease or, or your ancestry. There can be things that maybe are, are a little bit more private uh, that, that could be um, concealed within your genome that, that maybe you, you don't want someone else to know about. For that reason, uh, I think that whenever it comes to any sort of genome sequencing, I think that uh, the individual should have the right to decide what is done with that data. Um, and, and with that, uh, I, I think that um, you know, whatever is done with that data, if it's shared, it, it has to be shared with, with consent uh, from, from that individual. And the practices with 23andMe or Ancestry.com, uh, I'm not entirely sure how that, that process works in terms of consent to, to uh, you know, give, give them your data. Um, so I, I can't speak to the, the companies specifically, uh, but really in in my view what it comes down to is uh i think that the genetic data should be that of the individual and if if that individual wants to share their data with with someone else that's that's up to them uh and and they need to consent to it yeah and as of now uh what we have well what 23andme tells us or ancestry.com they do it just so that you know what's your problem, what's your health issues in case you want to know your ancestry, this stuff. And it's also the reason why you got, you told us you got into genomic sequencing. So let's take it a little bit uh, a step further. And what do we feel 
or what do you feel actually about human editing or genes like in case we have a gen uh, genetic disease yeah absolutely so so i think you know this this definitely gets into some some sticky situations in terms of genome editing um uh for treatment of disease uh i i think that there are you know a lot of things that that need to be studied before we can say in fact it's it's health uh or or it's it's safe um with that said i think that there's huge potential for it to to treat individuals with genetic disease and i think that if it's administered uh uh, safely and, and appropriately, I, I think that the potential is is huge and and it could uh, really um, impact the the health and well being of of human patients. Um, with that said, I think when it comes to uh, genome editing, uh, obviously if we're able to develop those technologies in in a safe way, uh, then you know, people could start to think about using them in, in other ways. Uh, so to select for desirable traits or, or uh, something outside of treatment of disease. Uh, and, and I think that is where, uh, uh, you know, the ethical talks need to, need to really uh, begin. And, and with that, I think that legislation needs to, to catch up in, in terms of setting, setting restrictions in, in terms of that. Yeah, th these things that you are mentioning right now are very interesting because they make me think a little bit about uh, the famous movie Garaka that um, probably you've watched. And if anyone that's listening to this hasn't watched, you should go watch the to consider all these ethical considerations that we're talking about. But yeah, uh, the concerning uh, diseases, of course, uh, it, it is a different thing, but uh, when it goes to physical traits, what is the, the extension that uh, editing can get to? And and of course, wh what are the, the possible dangers of, of this happening? Yeah, at this point, I mean, I'm not aware of anyone who is uh, editing their genome for, uh, uh, you know, enhancement of, of physical traits. Um, with that said, there there is or was, I'm not sure if it's still a thing, uh, the, the biohacker movement where uh, there, there were some people on, on YouTube that were claiming that they could uh, disrupt a gene called myostatin um, by, by doing at-home experiments. And now myostatin is, is a gene that's responsible for, for muscle development. So if you're able to, to edit or interrupt that, the idea is that, that you could you know, develop more muscle mass uh, through through this treatment. Um, now, I'm I'm pretty sure these YouTube sites have been taken down because obviously they're they're not safe uh, and and could be promoting some uh, something that uh, could could essentially harm others. Um, with that said, there there definitely was this biohacker movement. I don't know if if it's still a thing or or not. Uh, and and I uh, urge everyone to do their their research behind it and um, you know look look at the the safety data associated with any of these things. Um, with that said, uh, on, on more of a medical basis, uh, I, I don't think that genome editing for physical traits is is happening. Uh, with that said, again, the, the ethical implications of this are, are outstanding. Um, I think uh, a lot of it even, even comes down to, you know, the, the idea of social inequality or economical inequality. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the technology is there to make these types of things possible. However, uh, obviously, they, they'd cost a lot of money, even if they were available and, and were safe. So with that said, you know, the rich would be able to, you know, create them themselves to, to be better, uh, while the poor would, would not have uh, uh, those types of um, means uh, in order to do that. And with that, that could create uh, an even larger disparity in, in social inequalities. Uh, so, so let alone from, from the biological or health implications that it may have, you know, I think that there's, there's greater uh, uh, social impacts that uh, likely would be affected. This is a very important point that you, that you bring up because I, I, I was actually reading 
Catherine Page Harden's The Genetic Lottery and really recommend it. It's, uh, it's also why DNA matters for social inequality. And she mentions this fact where she contradicts also a very good writer, Robert Plumman, from his book, The Blueprint. But it's, it says that twin studies have shown that the heritability of a child's cognitive ability is lowest for children raised in poverty and highest from rich homes. And Robert Plumman says that socioeconomic status is not the cause, but it's the effect of the genes. He compares the UK private schools versus public schools. And he just says that those that are genetically superior, you could, you could say, are selected by the private schools because they already have the genetic means to get there. But then Catherine Page uses another fact that says 27% of rich children with the lowest polygenic ind indices graduated college, lo uh, lowest polygenic indices for education associated genes. Well, 27% graduated college while only 24% of the poorest children with the highest polygenic indices graduated college. So how do you see this nurture versus nature uh, of fight? Let's say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that this is a good point. And, you know, it, it's not surprising that um, uh, those individuals who are the richest yet have the lowest polygenic uh, score for, for intelligence uh, are are graduating from college, whereas uh, a lower percentage of, of the poorest with a high uh, um, uh, predictor for intelligence are, are not graduating. And, and this brings in the, the nature versus nurture uh, element. And, and we know that the genome interacts with, with the environment, right? Uh, so, so there's not going to be, you know, a clear cut answer when it comes to polygenic traits, uh, uh, such as um, intelligence. Um, obviously, there, there are other factors that are going to uh, hugely determine the, the outcome of, of uh, uh, this individual's life. Um, so, so playing together the, the, uh, the genome with, with the environment is, is going to be absolutely huge. Um, and, and we know that individuals who uh, are, are rich, they just, they, they have more opportunity, whether it's private tutoring or uh, are being sent to, to schools that are pushing them to, to the next level or, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and with that, uh, they'll, they'll be able to succeed in, in higher education compared to those individuals who, who maybe were just never given the opportunity, yet uh, their, their genes say they have every potential or they, they have the, the capacity to, to, to manage that. But without that opportunity given to them, uh, uh, they just wouldn't be able to exploit that within themselves. So uh, while, while the genetics can play a huge role in, in an ind individual's life, uh, certainly uh, socioeconomics uh, and, and the environment are, are going to play a huge role in, in the outcome, uh, no matter what the, the genome says. And I, actually, I, I feel like we went into polygenics indices without even explaining what they are. I just wanted to do that as a side note for the audience. Sure. So. Uh, yeah, so, so when we think about uh, traits that can be uh, uh, affected by the genome, we can think of them as either um, a Mendelian trait, where essentially, you know, there, there's one gene that's responsible or, or uh, you know, a very small change within the entire genome that's, that's responsible for that trait. Um, and normally, you know, uh, a small change is going to have a, a huge impact, whether whether the small change is a predictor of disease or saying that you're going to have blue eyes or brown eyes. There's not going to be a lot of in between. And um, the, the single change or the single gene is, is going to be responsible for the entirety of that trait. Whereas when we think about a polygenic trait, uh, which again in the name is uh, explaining that there are multiple genes associated with this, this single trait. So we can think about uh, a few different classic examples of polygenic traits, such as uh, body height um, or, or maybe even intelligence. 
Um, and, and again, essentially, this means that there are multiple changes throughout uh, many genes uh, that, that may impact uh, these, these traits within an individual. Now, with that said, unlike uh, a Mendelian trait where a single change is going to have a huge impact, it, it could be you know, the difference between uh, having a disease or not having a disease. When it comes to polygenic traits, um, sometimes they have less of a, an effect on, on that trait itself. So uh, a few changes within a few genes may make someone of medium height, whereas multiple changes across many of these genes that are associated associated with the polygenic trait uh, may, may result in an individual uh, being on either side of, of that average height spectrum. Um, so the effect uh, of uh, individual changes within a polygenic trait may be less, uh, less severe than that of one of a Mendelian trait. And are the SNPs also right. what uh, 23andMe so Hill... looks up or, or what is it they look up? Well, yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, are these SNPs for the polygenic indices the things that um, 23andMe looks up as for physical traits? Yeah, absolutely. So, so 23andMe, I'm not sure what their uh, uh, microarray or the number of SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, their, their chips are looking at. Um, but normally it's, it's in the range of a couple million um, or a couple hundred thousand to, to a couple million um, of these individual uh, changes within the genome. Yeah, yeah. So exactly to your point, Anton. Great. Doctor, this is a very interesting field. So I would want you to, to tell our audience or perhaps those people that are considering getting a little bit deeper into the field of genetics that is very interesting and there's a lot to learn because it's going to have a lot of implications for the future. So what is some of the most interesting things that you would recommend to people considering this about your job? Uh, about my job or about sequencing their own genome? Uh, and your discipline and, and, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that, uh, you know, genetics right now, uh, it's it's absolutely booming. The, the technologies uh, continue to, to develop, uh, both in terms of genome sequencing and all of the computational type of analysis that, that we can do with it. So, so whether you're a biologist or a uh, uh, a computational scientist or a machine learning expert, I think that there's there's room for for you to to look for a career within within genetics. Uh, and and I think you know in in terms of medical genetics, uh, there there are so many promising uh, uh, things that that will come within the next couple of years. Um, in fact, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of the, the human individuals on, on this planet have their genome sequenced uh, uh, within the next 10 or, or 20 years. Uh, and with that, being able to uh, uh, look for uh, things that may be associated with risk of disease or, or uh, you know, what types of foods you should be eating to, to keep yourself the healthiest or, you know, um, identification of, of things that, that can promote the, the health of individuals. Um, it, it's, it's really promising at, at this point. Uh, and, and I think there's so much room for expansion. So, so like I say, if you're considering uh, a role in, in uh, the world of genetics, uh, it, there, there's not a single route to get there. You don't have to study biology or, or uh, you know, genetics specifically. There's, there's many other ways to get involved, um, whether it's through... Uh... Yeah, r right now that you brought up the point about the food you eat, there is also a huge field on genetically modified or organisms, I believe, the GMOs. Sure. So could you explain to our audience what is it that they do? How is it that they're modified? Yeah, so I, I don't know uh, the, the specifics of their technology, um, but uh, essentially what uh, seed companies or agricultural companies that, that develop seeds to, to sell, um, they, they're inserting genes into plants that essentially can make them resistant either to disease or uh, maybe to drought or, or other types of, of things that, that could then in turn make the uh, production or the agricultural production of, of these plants um, uh, 
uh, more efficient. Um, so uh, they can splice genes in um, that that can prevent I don't know some sort of tomato rot or or make them uh, less uh, uh, or more resistant to to some sort of uh, 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 insects or or other types of disease. Um, now, with that said, there there's been a lot of concern in terms of human health uh, in terms of consuming. Uh, um, plants that have been genetically modified. And in the early days, I think that there was a, um, a study out of France um, that, that initially showed that uh, mice and rats that ate genetically modified organisms were more likely or had a higher risk of developing uh, certain types of cancers. Now, with that said, that paper, uh, if, if I'm correct, has been retracted um, because uh, there, there were problems with, with the data um, and uh, all subsequent studies show, show no increased risk, at least in animal models, in terms of prevalence of, of disease associated with eating uh, genetically modified organisms. Oh, that, so with that said, obviously, when, when we think about uh, the farming industry and, and maybe farming uh, monoculture or a single plant on, on a land, um, uh, that can have implications on, on the biodiversity within that ecosystem itself. Uh, that, that could be detrimental. Um, we know that diversity in, in human populations or animal populations and plant populations are, are definitely beneficial on many levels and we can think about farms being being the same when it comes to biodiversity yeah. so while there may not be uh, human health implications of gmos uh, i i think that there are uh, other other types of uh, things that need to be considered including biodiversity yeah speaking about biodiversity i recommend a lot to watch this netflix documentary called on natural selection in which they there is a, a problem and where they decide to play God or not because there are rats that are infesting some fields, but they can genetically modify the rats so that they are not attacking the food. I don't remember specifically. That's why I really hope that you watch the documentary. But at, at, at what point can we stop ourselves from genetically modifying other stuff that is not us if we're still not modifying them ourselves? Yeah, and, I, and just coming into this a little bit, there was well, there's this um, podcast by uh, someone who I admire a lot, Santiago Naidu, called Sam Harris, and he always finished his podcast with one question. And now that we have a genetic sequencer, I would love to do this question: Should we bring the T. Rex back, as they do in Jurassic Park, or not? And why should we or shouldn't we? Hey, I think that that's a fantastic question. I am a fan of Jurassic Park and, and the idea of bringing uh, the T-Rex or any other type of dinosaur back is, is definitely intriguing. And while I would love to see uh, a live T-Rex, I, I think that it would be entirely inappropriate. Uh, our, our planet has, has developed uh, from, from the point of dinosaur extinction to, to the point that we are now. And for the most part, it did that through natural means. I think that it would be inappropriate for us to, uh, um, you know, reverse all of that uh, for our own entertainment. Yes, I, I gotta say I agree, even though it would be amazing to watch T-Rex live. <laughs> But Dr. Gorsinski, thank you very much for being with us here today in 2084. And audience, there you go, from a, world, a Guinness World Record holder, who I, I think you did the genome sequencing in under eight hours, right? If I'm correct? That's that's correct. Yeah, we, we diagnosed a patient in seven hours and 18 minutes, which uh, oh, wow. was uh, significantly faster than the previous world record. Uh, what was, if, if I may ask, do you remember? It was 14 and a half hours, the, the last one. So, so we cut it in half. Wow, that's amazing. amazing. Well, doctor, thank you very much. It was an honor having you in, in 2084. And hopefully, at least for my part, I can say that I learned a lot. I think the audience as well. So, so we're very thankful to, to have you here and thank you for your time. Yep. Thanks thank you for very having much. me and have a good night. Thank you. Too. You too. All Bye. the best. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.